Hello, I'm Natasha Gutierrez. I'm sitting here today with Marcus Broccoli of North Face Media. North Face Media has just invested in Rappler and we will speak to Marcus about what that means for Rappler and for North Face Media. Hi Marcus, thank you for Natasha. joining us. Great to be here. Let's start from the very beginning. Tell us first off about North Face Media and how you got into it. North Face Media is a small investment company that was set up by a couple of friends of mine, Sasha Vucinich, who was the original founder of the Media Development Loan Fund, which was a company that had provided capital through loans to media in post-communist Eastern and Central Europe. And Stuart Carl, who was previously the chief operating officer at Reuters, and before that had worked for a long time as general counsel of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones. And, and I, we together decided that there was a great opportunity to support independent media in growth markets around the world and to look for technologies that also support media, not only in growth markets, but in other, in other markets. Um, our feeling is that we are on the precipice of a lot of powerful change in world media markets, that there is still great opportunity to build strong, viable, independent media businesses in many countries. And we wanted to help those people who are starting those companies to succeed. That said, why Rappler? Rappler is a perfect alignment of our interests and the goals of the founders. Um, Rappler is a company that is dedicated, as Maria Ressa likes to say, to redefining journalism, keeping the soul and the spirit of journalism, but adapting to the technology changes that have swept our world, finding new ways of delivering journalism to audiences, engaging with audiences from the ground up as well as top down. And we're big believers that independent media should connect with audiences in new ways, that technologies are fundamentally transforming the way that journalism should be practiced. Maria and her team understood that. I've known Maria for many years. When Maria and I first started talking about this, it was probably a year ago. And we had just launched North Base Media. Rappler was already well underway. And it couldn't have been a more perfect fit for what we were trying to do. What does the investment mean? The investment is really a partnership. Okay. I think the, the way to think of this is we bring to Rappler our experience and whatever counsel or advice the team at Rappler might want from us. You know, I, I have had the honor of running a couple of big newsrooms, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. My partners, Sasu Vucinich, was a founder of a couple of news startups in, in Central Europe and then went on to run the Media Development Loan Fund for many years. Mm. Stuart Carl, who's an, another partner, was general counsel of the Wall Street Journal, one of the best media lawyers in the world, and went on to become chief operating officer at Reuters. So we're making ourselves available. We'll offer whatever advice Rappler might want. Mm -hmm. And in, in exchange, you know, what, what we want is we want to be able to take many of the ideas and the pioneering concepts that Rappler is working with in the Philippines and mm -hmm. deploy them in other markets. Because I think Rappler is one of the most innovative, if not the most innovative, digital media companies we have seen in any growth market around the world. That's interesting. Because I think there were discussions on whether this model of Rappler only works in specific places. What do you think about that? You know, I, I think we're in a really interesting Chain, fast changing world for media. And the audiences for news are, in many cases, audiences who've never before consumed media. They're consuming news over smartphones. Millions, tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world in coming years will be interacting with media for the first time over smartphones they're buying. You know, if you take, for example, India, really interesting market. Mm. You know, 1.2, 1.3 billion people of whom only 200 million have smartphones, of which only 100 million have data plans attached. So it's very early days yeah. so far okay. in terms of how those people are going to interact with media. I suspect that when people get on their smartphones for the first time and they discover that there's information out there, internet.org, which is a Facebook affiliated group that's been working to try and deliver internet and Facebook to people in developing countries, has done a lot of research in this and found that one of the first things people look for when they get online and when they get a smartphone and get access to the internet, they look for information, information about their community, information about the world. People are deeply curious about what's going on around them and information is valuable. Mm -hmm. Information can be you know, telling a farmer in a village who gets a smartphone for the first time what the price of his commodities should be. 
information can be, you know, helping somebody to understand what, what banking relationship they should have, or where their kids should go to school, or what they should expect of the curriculum in the school. Mm -hmm. And all these things are now possible through smartphones. In every country, the, peop the interest of people who get online, at least at the beginning, is the same. And many of these people, they, they have no existing relationship, no pre-existing relationship with any media provider. So if you have a really great media product that's clear and smart and independent and authentic, and I think this is something that really bears underscoring, people in digital media, readers of digital media, consumers of digital media, are acutely conscious of what is authentic and real, and they know the difference between that and that which is provided by the state or by oligarch-controlled media, which in many countries has been the dominant media. So when you have something like Rappler, which is really the combination of great journalism, you know, a great team of journalists from the top down at Rappler, people who have vast experience in journalism, but also content that's being shaped by the readers of Rappler, mm -hmm. content that's being driven by the needs, the civic interests of the readers of Rappler. Put that combination together, it's very powerful, and it can work in any market. The technologies that Rappler uses, you know, the way it serves up advertising and uses social media to find communities for their advertisers, mm -hmm. that'll work anywhere in the world. Have you seen trends emerge that work across the board? The notion that a media company needs to provide a plaza, a place for its audience to come together, to interact, mm. to engage with content, but all under the umbrella of a media company. So in effect, you create the place for your readers to spend their time and create content and communicate with each other. Um, I think you're seeing much tighter integration of technology platforms and, um, and the content so that when people produce content, it's being tailored for a certain kind of delivery, whether it's on social media or you know, directly on, on different phone or mobile applications. Um, I think the, there is a great emphasis right now on personalization. Every media company is grappling with this question of how do you mm. provide people with the news they're most likely to want based on their previous behavior. Um, Aggregation is something that I see a lot of right now. Media companies trying to deliver content that may not be what they've created themselves, but they know their readers will be interested in that come from other places, you know, the Huffington Post model or mm -hmm. Business Insider model, you might say. Um, all these things are sort of blending together. There's another interesting phenomenon happening right now in, in media, in journalism media, which is there's a blurring of, of, of approaches. So. What, what previously might have seemed like different products, people are kind of blurring together. To give you a specific example, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at BuzzFeed, which is a really powerful, engaging, lively, dynamic stream of content, it's probably, and you know, Ben Smith, the editor of BuzzFeed might dispute this, but it's probably like 90% stuff that has nothing to do with journalism. Right. It's content, it's lively and it's fresh. Mm -hmm. But they tack on a lot of journalism, and some of the journalism is quite good. Some of the journalism is perhaps less good. They have investigative desk. They have investigative journalism, mm -hmm. and you know, there's you could ask questions like, are they doing the news because they're trying to improve their performance on the Facebook algorithm as a news content company, or are they doing it because they deeply believe in news? But it's a little bit like a television network from the 1960s in the U.S., where you might have soap operas and game shows and entertainment and you know, light fair and a you know, lively morning talk show, mm -hmm. and then you know, a half hour of news at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. That's very serious news and 60 minutes on Sunday. And it's not the same thing as the New York Times. But what you're seeing is you're seeing every media company looking at what every other media company is doing mm -hmm. and asking, well, should we be adapting some of what they're doing? Or are they adopting some of what they're doing? Adapting mm -hmm. and adopting some mm -hmm. of what they're doing. And that's a phenomenon I think that's worth watching. You've held top posts in the Washington Post as well as the Wall Street Journal. Do you think that in places like that, institutions, it's harder to adapt and adjust? Do you think that in a sense there are more limitations? You're constrained in legacy media companies by what your readers expect of you. So you've built out a huge range of coverage and you've sold your readers on this bundle of information. And 
if you were doing purely a digital media company, you would let the data guide you to some extent. First of all, you decide what your audience you're going after, and you're building from the ground up and you're starting fresh. And you say, okay, we're going to deliver this strain of content mm -hmm. to, to our readers, and this is who we want to be. And you can be very focused on it and let the data tell you what readers you're going after, what content is working, and what you should do more of, what you should do less of. If you've built up, if you're running a legacy media company, you always have this challenge that there are readers for the whole range of content that you produce. And some of those readers may read the food section mm. or the book section or some section that your data, the information you're getting from you know, online and from research tells you that very few people read and doesn't produce much value to the company. But you can't just cut it because if you cut it, you know, you're, you're diminishing the bundle that you've told people you're, you're going to deliver to them. That's a big burden for a lot of these companies. At the same time, you have advertising you know, looking to mm. go much more targeted. They have digital media telling them exactly how to connect with certain audiences. And digital advertising is a lot cheaper in terms of reaching a consumer that you're after than print advertising. Print advertising, by definition, you hit a lot of consumers you're not targeting. Mm -hmm. Whereas digital, you the whole game in digital right now is to be as precise as you can be in terms of delivering a specific consumer to the advertiser. I guess a concern is with online and the internet and technology making it easy to start companies, media companies in a way, would that compromise credibility? Because back then, it was not that easy to obviously to start media companies and now that it's easier, does that compromise certain journalistic values, for instance? I don't think how easy it is or how hard it is to start a media company has anything to do with your credibility. I think credibility is something you earn. Like, let's take Rappler. Rappler has a lot of credibility. I don't think anybody doubts the seriousness of the journalism that's practiced at Rappler mm -hmm. or the commitment of the people who run Rappler to produce high quality, independent, smart, accountability journalism. Rappler hasn't been around a long time. But by pursuing with really great clarity of focus those objectives, Rappler has credibility. Um, you know, credibility is probably the most important coin of the realm in traditional journalism. And if you don't have credibility, if you're trying to be a serious journalism outfit, mm -hmm. it's really hard to make a living. And so, you know, we look as as a investors, as funders of media companies, as advisors to media companies, we look for those people who understand, even as they're starting media companies up, that the real value of their media company will come from the quality of their journalism and their commitment to independent, strong, authentic, accountability journalism. Okay. Clearly you believe in what Rappler is doing, but what do you think is the biggest challenge for Rappler moving forward? Rappler has grown very fast mm -hmm. and maintaining that growth um, reaching audiences across the Philippines. Uh, Rappler, as you know, is extended into Indonesia a bit. It's tiptoeing into the regional market. And there may well be um, opportunities for Rappler to become a, a much bigger voice uh, for, a much bigger platform for voices across the region. Because I think the way I think of Rappler is the way I think indeed of, of a lot of digital media companies is they are increasingly venues for people to express their own voices. I mean, they have to be a reflection of the communities they're serving. They can't be, again, top down. They have to be a mix of information that's relevant and important mm -hmm. and, and filtered, but also information that is produced by and shaped by the readers and consumers of that information. We've talked about all these changes, everything the technology has brought. What do you think, having been, having been a reporter for decades and obviously you know, having worked for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, what is the single biggest change you've seen in the industry? Technology has profoundly disrupted the media industry. And, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. It's distressing to have your, you know, extremely profitable, well-established institutional business suddenly having to struggle and fight for advertising dollars, for readers, for content. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, it's exhilarating. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a more interesting time in media because, you know, if you go back 150 years when there were a lot of startup media companies, you know, the, uh, one of the fun facts I learned when I was editor of the Washington Post is in the 19th century, mm -hmm. 
in that hundred years, there were about a hundred newspapers, a hundred daily newspapers that opened and closed during that century in Washington because people were printing newspapers one sheet at a time or on slow moving printing presses and they were serving specific communities. And most people who started newspapers or, or magazines were trying to serve a specific fragment of the society because you couldn't print enough copies to serve the whole society. Well today, you know, and those, and those things by the way were costly to set up, hard to do, and they were mostly formed with political agenda. Most newspapers that were started in the 19th century were aimed at a specific audience or a specific political cause. Well today we live in an era where pretty much anybody can have an idea for a media company. Mm. And if, if they're smart about how they execute it, the tools available to them to build an audience are easily available, inexpensive, and incredibly effective. And a clever young woman or young man in any community can serve his community or her community with information and engage them in conversation and provide them with the tools and the information they need to make good, smart decisions about how they want their society to work, and it's all possible. And what we know about how people consume content today mm -hmm. may have nothing to do with how people are going to consume content tomorrow. I mean, you know, I grew up in a world where you read the newspaper from front to back, and it was sort of your briefing, and you came into the world stronger for having every day, for having read the newspaper from front to back, briefed on what mattered. Mm. And today, you might wake up in the morning, grab your cell phone, look at your Twitter feed, which by the way, causes your attention span instantly to atrophy to 140 characters, <laughs> and then start linking through to articles. And you're not reading comprehensively in the same way you did before, mm. but you may be reading much deeper on the things you care about. Yes. And so it's fundamentally transforming how people engage with information. And I'm not pessimistic about that. I'm interested in it. I want to see how it plays out, but I'm quite confident that you know, we live in a society full of incredibly smart, capable people. And the generation that you know, created Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or Line or WhatsApp is quite capable of figuring out how to look after its information interests. We, the media and journalism world, need to figure out what our place in that and how we work and work with and connect to those people is. Isn't it scary that things it's ex it's are changing it's so quickly overnight? It's almost like, do you think we are going to reach a point of stability the same way newspapers were the way of life for, for decades? Or is it constantly going to evolve? It's constantly going to change. That's, that's quite terrifying for so, someone who's had stability for I'm years. I'm not sure it's terrifying for consumers. Yes. So if you it's talk to, if, you, if you go talk to young people, you talk to my teenage daughters about the amount of information that they're getting and whether mm. they feel like their information needs are being met. There's no complaint. They, I mean, if anything, I can't pry their phones out of their hands and get them to pay attention to anything substantive. You know, you're looking at it from the, you know, the content producer's point of view. Isn't it scary that everything is changing? I'm like, yeah, I'm a little sorry for you guys that your life <laughs> is going to be a little bit more complicated. But on the other hand, you know. What is life if it's not if it doesn't have lots of challenges and, and cycles of adventure in it? You know, once it gets to that point where it's stable and consistent, I think we call that retirement. <laughs> and that's not so interesting. It's true. Although I think what's exciting is everyone is still trying to figure it out right now. And I just wonder if anytime soon it's gonna get to a place where we figured it out and it's going to stay that way for quite a while. I think the, or you think those the things are idea over. that you will figure everything out and it will stay that way is finished. And you know, I think that's a healthy thing. I think you know, the constant change in some, in an abstract, more abstract way of thinking about it is our society doing that healthy practice of rethinking its, rethinking its own behavior mm -hmm. and trying to optimize and trying to figure out what is, the, what is it that the society needs and wants and how is it that people want to engage with information. And we, the content producers or journalists, we, we play a role in that. Mm -hmm. But we're not the only people who play a role in that anymore. Where do you think journalism is headed? I think journalism is changing rapidly, but I am quite confident that the fundamental principles of journalism that matter to me and to the folks who put out Rappler are absolutely um, critical mm. to the survival of a certain kind of journalism. You know, independence, fairness, a quest for the truth as nearly as it can be ascertained, um, 
accountability of the powerful, um, transparency of issues that need to be made transparent, a civic, a sense of civic responsibility. These things are, are critical elements of journalism. And the mix, they don't all come from one place, they may not all happen at the same time, but the mix of values that together comprise good journalism is as relevant, as important, as central to the success of any journalism outfit today, whatever medium, however they convey that content, as it ever has been. Great. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Marcus. My pleasure. I was just speaking with Marcus Broccoli of North Face Media, who talked to us about their investment in Rappler and what that means for both companies. I'm Natasha Gutierrez. Thank you for, st thank you for stopping by.